Hello and welcome to the Unrest Podcast. I'm Caitlin Stansel. I'm Madeline Green. And I'm Carter Coyle. And we officially have three married old ladies on the call. Woo-woo. Three married hags. <laughs> Caitlin <laughs> is married. Woohoo! And it was it was quite the wedding for all of us. <laughs> it was really, really, really epic and fun and amazing. I'm still recovering. I honestly though my feet I don't think I've ever had my feet hurt so bad I don't know if it's like that concrete floor or what I had to get Matt to rub my feet it had to be the concrete because my feet were killing me for days as well and I think just like you know being there and decorating and everything all week on the floor I don't know my feet were just like all right lady off of it (laughs) My thighs were very, Um, my thighs were really sore from drunkenly thinking I was still young and spry enough to do, you know, the boots with the fur, get low, get low, get low. I learned a long time ago that my knees can only go so low and literally like all those girls would be like dropping it down and I'm like halfway like, oh yeah. I was like, Nick, whenever I dip, like, you have to put your arm out to hold me. And he's like, wow, that's sexy. (laughs) I'm like, help me, help me get low. (laughs) Help me get back up. (laughs) All right, I need to help me get back up on the dance floor. We had so much fun. We danced and danced. It was a great time, Caitlin. Thank you. I, I think everyone needed kind of a nice fun break. I think everybody's been dreaming of like where they would go, where they would visit, like once travel restrictions are lifted. I know that my husband has a lot of people in his office who are going to Key West right now because it's still America. So you can go without having to have a passport. So that actually is kind of inspired an idea for us to look at some haunted places on Key West. Carter, have you been to Key West? I've never been. I've always wanted to go. And Nick really, really wants to go. Um, but yeah, I don't, I've never been. I'd love to. Yeah. It's a great place. But you've been mad. <laughs> Caitlin, have you been? I went, you know, recently within the last year or so. Um, but our trip was so just busy. We didn't have time to fit everything in, but I definitely wanted to go on a ghost tour while we were there. And that's kind of what inspired my story for this week. So it's said that there may be more ghosts residing in the island town than the living. No, nope. okay. cool. yeah. but there's one story that kind of really stood out to me and it's probably something that you wouldn't consider consider finding in this place um but it may be one of the most haunted children's toys in the world yeah. have you ever heard of robert the doll no <laughs> Can't say that i have don't know if i want to hear about robert the doll <laughs> he's creepy i'm just gonna lay that out there already uh, not only is his name kind of creepy, I don't know what it is, but Robert for a doll just kind of freaks me out a bit. I did not go see it, but that was, we wanted to go, but you can. He's like in this museum and he's in like a little glass box. Wow. And sometimes he moves around in there apparently, but he stands at more than three feet tall. So he's large. He's not just like a little baby doll. And he's made of this sort of like wood shaving kind of stuffing and his origins are a bit unclear there definitely though seems to be some sort of voodoo connection to him so some of these stories say that robert the doll was given to eugene otto that's his owner as a young boy and he was given to him by his grandfather and the doll apparently came from a trip to germany so robert is actually eugene's first name so he essentially named the doll after himself and eugene is his middle name which he went by he reminds me, do you guys remember those creepy little dolls? And like, they would be like this covering their face and you would put them in the corner and it looked like a little kid was crying in the corner, but it was yeah. that size. But they it didn't was- have a face, right? No. No, they were creepier than Robert. But, but- they were called something weird too. Uh, well, <laughs> this close up of him is fucking terrifying. Also, That's what he looks one- like. <laughs> oh, Madeline, I bet you're looking at one of the replicas of him. So there are replicas oh. that they sell. 
So another story says that Eugene received Robert from a Bahamian maid that worked for the family. And this is notable because apparently his family wasn't very nice to their maids or servants. Uh Uh-oh. And she had been caught using voodoo and was fired. But before she left, she used that voodoo to curse the doll that she had given to Eugene to bring fear and discomfort to the family. Yeah. Don't take gifts from people you just fired. (laughs) That's probably a good life lesson. Uh Uh-huh. The place where he resides now, he's holding this little, like, stuffed dog or lion. And he looks kind of like a vet. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. And he's, like, covered with these little marks that could be from normal wear tear it kind of looks like where you have a champagne cork and there are pieces missing out of it yeah Um, but some say maybe they kind of resemble scars and he has these dabs yeah or like cuts or something Mm. and then he has these dark beady eyes that you're not supposed to look directly into and he has a smirk on his face that some say changes at times but that's creepy yeah yeah Creepy stuff started pretty quickly. Eugene was really close with this doll and he took it everywhere with him. And then at times, his parents said that they would overhear him having conversations with the doll. And so he would talk to Robert, but then they would hear a different voice replying. And they just assumed at the time that it was Eugene kind of changing his voice to pretend to reply as Robert would. Oh, shit. And it was like a, a deeper kind of creepier voice. I don't know how else to describe it besides creepy. (laughs) Robert was said to have some kind of like hold on Eugene and they would be up in Eugene's room at night and his parents would hear this like loud, violent commotion happening. They would hear furniture moving, things would be ripped apart and then they'd go in there and be like, what the hell's going on, Eugene? And he would just say, he would be like huddled on his bed, so scared and he would just say, Robert did it. Mm. So it's either Robert or Eugene's just like fucking weird as fuck and <laughs> blames on his dog. Bro, I feel like that sounds plausible, but <laughs> no, it's not right. But really, he is he is weird as fuck. No, it's not he... so much that Robert the doll is a ghost. He's like a possessed doll, kinda. I think, or like a voodoo cursed a doll. Voodoo cursed doll, or or it's just Eugene, Eugene. just blames it on him, or yeah. creepy ass Eugene. <laughs> say from the beginning who the hell Eugene even is like is he a famous person in Key West or just a guy his family was in Key West and he is just the owner of Robert the doll from what I've seen wow what a legacy (laughs) but so like Robert now is in this museum and he's in this glass thing and you can go see him and he has actually been blamed people that have visited and like I guess looked into his eyes or whatever He's been blamed for causing car accidents, relationship breakdowns, divorces, <laughs> death, disease, and more. And people will send in letters apologizing to Robert for taking his photo without permission, thinking that that is what caused all these things. That's great. Wow. I'm really glad that you did not see Robert at all. And this one website said, write him a letter and see if he replies. I'm like, oh, fuck that. Whether he's messed up or not. What a great <laughs> thing. Like, we're at Key West and like, you know, you cheat on your husband and <laughs> it was Robert the doll, y'all. I would <laughs> have just, not. Personally, I would never do that. But Robert <laughs> told me to. <laughs> Obviously, you know, I would never buy sketchy drugs or anything like that. From a flea market and take them. But yeah, Robert but would. Robert but told Robert me to. 100% would. I would never drink and drive and cause a car crash. But Robert yeah, said it was I okay would. that I can make it home. Robert said, you're not drunk. <laughs> a website called Haunted Rooms. Um, I guess it's from the UK and they did this whole little write-up on Robert the doll. But they said that staff at the museum claim that Robert has been found in different positions in his case, that footsteps have been heard around the museum at night with no apparent explanation for the noise, and that Robert's expression has been known to change from neutral to nasty in the blink of an eye. But no one has it on camera? I don't know. And then it says museums or museums, visitors to the museum are given advice on how to approach Robert. It says to to speak to him in a polite way, to ask his permission to photograph him and to treat him with respect. 
Aww. And like on the walls around his display are all these letters from visitors apologizing for their behavior when they came to the museum. So he just needs a little R-E-S-P-E-C-T. <laughs> I would just like y'all to know I've decided to name my future post news memoir from neutral to nasty. <laughs> <laughs> I really oh. do love that. Like like Robert the Doll, news news reporter what's, spills all. <laughs> what's interesting oh is that it's in a museum, right? Yeah. But like and it's been known to move or change, but like surely they have cameras, right? I mean, you would think. Let's see. Let me look on YouTube. Why haven't we caught him in the act? Yeah, I mean, that's worth us a hundred dollars simply safe cam right there. <laughs> I'll put I'll put up the money for it. Mm-hmm. Okay, this says Robert's doll rules after dark. News flash for our listeners: My dog ate five full chicken wings yesterday, bones and all. Swallowed those things whole. So we really hope Trix makes it. Just when I think we found all the creepiest stuff in this world things like robert the doll come up yeah yeah he kind of so like at first you know i thought he was kind of cute but now he kind of makes me uncomfortable i know that's why i don't like to look at pictures of him yeah you know, that me sound, out. that's the sound of madeline backpedaling <laughs> that's the sound of madeline's anxiety <laughs> fueled fueled by thermogenic and pre-workout <laughs> <laughs> and ghosts. <laughs> Robert the doll is going to come after her for calling him innocent. I'm sorry, Robert. That's the story of Robert the doll, but Key West has a lot of ghost stories. There are some other cool ones about um, St. Paul's Church, if you ever want to look that up. I was going to talk about some of it here, but it's hard to find like real detailed accounts of it. We took like a trolley tour one day, and they just kind of tell you like history stuff, but they mixed in a little bit of ghosty things. And they were talking about how the church, someone there, the church was mad and they set fire to this house and these children, I guess, died in the fire and they haunt the graveyard there now. And Mm. apparently you can see the kids if you go visit the graveyard of this church. No thanks. So, yeah. So there's just like a lot of ghostly things in Key West if you ever visit. Do you know if there's like any reasoning behind why there's a lot of ghostly things? I just think it has a lot of history there, Um, you know pirates and right people right. have been living there for hundreds of years and there's kind of like voodoo connection that new orleans kind of has you know right, so right. um i just think there's a lot of history there and part of that history includes ernest hemingway i don't know about y'all but when i think of qs i think of cats and i've never even been there i think of you think of cats and i think of chickens because there's chickens everywhere i have this video of aj there was like a a mama chicken and she had like some little chicks with her and they were walking towards the road and i was like aj go turn them around they're about to get in the road and he like went over and was like shooing them back (laughs) but tell us about the cat first i'm I'm gonna set the scene for you a little bit okay this is like the pinnacle of my podcasting career getting to talk about cats unrestricted Um, so let me set the scene for you, okay? It's back in the old days. We're on a ship. It's stormy. Things are rocking. You're feeling kind of sick. We're right off this Key West coast. You see a rat scurry by. Oh, gross. And then what chases after it? A cat. Not just any cat, a six-toed cat. (gasps) Well, that, ladies and gentlemen, is how polydactyl cats came to be known as good luck. Because they were known as sailors' friends because they have multiple toes on each paw, uh, more than the use, and therefore have better balance on a ship as it's tossing around in the wind. So, and then they also control rodent populations on ships. So, that is how they all kind of uh, came to be known as good luck. And the story goes that a ship's captain was drinking downtown Key West. I don't know if downtown's the right word, just in Key West, with uh, Ernest Hemingway back in the day. And he really liked Ernest and ended up gifting him a white six-toed cat named Snow White. Hmm. Some, I think, say Snowball, but Snow White is the generally accepted uh, name of that first kitty cat. And now the Ernest Hemingway Home and Museum 
in Key West is home to at least 60 polydactyl cats. So normally cats, in case you didn't know, have five toes on each of their front paws and four toes on their back paws. But polydactyl cats can have up to nine toes on each paw. Oh, wow. Although generally they have, it's like six and it's almost always on the front paws, although they can have six on, they can have five or six on the back. But um, yeah, so Ernest Hemingway's cats or Hemingway cats are known as six, or six toe cats. And even though um, it's according to the website of the Hemingway home, about half the cats at the museum have like the physical six toes but they all carry the polydactyl gene. So Hmm. any of those cats at the Hemingway house are Hemingway cats. And so any of them have the potential of producing um, offspring with that are polydactyl. So this is a huge uh, cool thing for people who go to the Hemingway house. Like you, you gotta like cats because there are currently cats everywhere and they, they are allowed in the places that humans aren't, you know, if you're walking through the house that you might see them lounging on the furniture or whatever that you're not allowed to get on, but the cats, it sounds like have pretty much free reign there. So Snow White started the trend and before you knew it, Hemingway cats on Key West and a lot of other cats on Key West, cause you know, it's hard to c- contain them have this trait the polydactyl trait it's actually pretty common along the east coast but this is like where polydactyl cats are known so i'm going to tell you a little bit about the hemingway cats they're not necessarily a particular breed so it's a trait not a breed if that makes sense so you could have tabbies or tortoiseshells or white and black tuxedo cats all can have six toes and Mm -hmm. i'll share my screen here with you they are cute as a button It says they carry the polydactyl gene. Mm. So here's some of the the beautiful cats there. But see, they all look totally different. The thing they have in common are these big old, big old paws. How they're not? It's not like they're not freaky looking, in my opinion. They're just big paws. They look like just big paws. Um, It looks like they have thumbs. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. See how he's got thumbs? And then here was a great picture on this one of this kitty's extra. Oh wow! Isn't he pretty? In the cat world, cat. in the cat world, we call their little toes beans. So they have extra beans. <laughs> <laughs> in the cat world. <laughs> beans. So um, yeah, apparently the cats kept Ernest Hemingway company as he wrote his novels, and um, he really loved them, and so did his family. It sounds like so he named all of the cats after famous people, and sometimes put a little kitty cat twist on them. So that's kind of fun. Um, and they still do that to this day. And uh, from what I what I was reading, they want to carry the tradition and like keep the cats coming, but they don't want to have overpopulation. So they allow the female cats to have one litter and then they're spayed. Mm. And they keep like a male tomcat around for the for getting the business done. So that's how they kind of keep it in the family, but they keep enough uh, gene variation to not like be, have like crazy in, incest cats. Um, and they have plenty of chickens around there to catch and eat. <laughs> that's what it sounds like. Um, I also read that they have a veterinarian who's dedicated to, to coming by like once a week who checks them all for their fleas and their ear mites and spaying and, uh, you know, helps with the spaying and worming and all that. So these are really, really well taken care of cats and they're a beloved part of the community there. This was, this was a little bit more about their origination, but they, they like basically in all the port towns is kind of where these six-toed cats have popped up because of the sailors, so that makes sense. And they are not very common in Europe uh, because they believe they were once hunted because people associated them with witchcraft. So hmm. they are also called mitten cats, boxing cats, conch cats, mitten foot cats, snowshoe cats, six-fingered cats, thumb cats, and cardi cats. What was the last one? Cardi cats. Cardi cats. I don't know. So it, lo- it looks like Cardi like B. Cardi B. Cardi cats. Oh, here. This is a good, good one. T- talking about the gene, Caitlin. The reason the cats have extra toes, according to the book Herding Hemingway's Cats, is a mistake in the control switch for a gene called Sonic Hedgehog. Yes, it was named after the video game character. I love hmm. Sonic. 
two German scientists coined the name after noticing that some fruit fly maggots with a gene expression were stumpy and covered with bristles. They looked like a hedgehog. They let their daughter, like one of the daughters of these scientists had a Sonic the Hedgehog book. And there we go. It's now the Sonic Hedgehog gene. So that is actually what um, their name, what the gene is that causes polydactyl cats. There is a little bit of discrepancy on, on Snow White the cat because Hemingway's son said that he never had a cat in Key West, but a neighbor said that, no, the family had lots of polydactyl cats, and that's kind of how this whole thing all started. So it sounds like they, that I guess Hemingway lived or had a house in Cuba too and definitely had cats there. So I don't know like what the status of that house is, but it, I'd be interested to know if they had six toe cats there too. Ernest met the sea captain at Sloppy Joe's bar one night, and the two of them got drunk, and the sea captain gave Ernest a multi-toed cat right off his ship. Sloppy Joe's is still there and operating. Mm-hmm. That's cool. So now they, um, they have names such as Harry, H-A-I-R-Y, Harry Truman, <laughs> Fats Waller, Kermit Shine Forbes, Truman Capote, Bugsy Siegel, Billy Holiday, and Cary Grant. So cute. The employees, they do keep on the tradition of naming them after famous people. Employees vote on the names. And this was really interesting. This is on mentalfloss.com. Hemingway's cats were the subject of a federal complaint. The five-year battle kicked off in 2003 after a visitor was concerned about the cat's welfare, which sounds like kind of bullshit to me because it sounds like these cats have quite the life. That person filed a complaint with the federal government and the USDA claimed the museum was exhibiting the cats without a proper license, which it wouldn't have been able to qualify for anyway because the license requires animals to be enclosed. Regardless, employees in the Hemingway house claimed that the, F- the USDA sent undercover agents in to investigate and pose as tourists, get pictures, and start getting video of the cats, according to CBS. The agency threatened to fine the museum $200 per cat per day to remove the cats from the premises or to remove the cats from the premises. So they fought back and forth. And eventually an animal behaviorist who was kind of a neutral party um, said the cats really do appear to be well cared for. What if we just build this special fence and everybody kind of agreed to that. So I guess the cats got to stay because a special fence was installed. Um, Another little Another little note here, uh, one of the Hemingway cats was jailed, quote unquote, once because it, sn- it nipped at a tourist who was bugging it, <laughs> and um, they, they made it go to jail at the vet's office for- I love that. For uh, 10 days. <laughs> so it had to go in a 10-day quarantine, and then Martha, the jailed cat, was able to go back to the Hemingway house. Wow. I mean, that would be like suing the town of Key West because there are too many chickens. Like, Right. I mean, what are you... Yeah. Like, they, they don't belong to anyone. They're just running around. They're there. <laughs> um, the museum tells people not to bring in catnip, as you can imagine. That would cause quite the frenzy. Yeah. And um, then lastly, um, this was kind of interesting, too. During Hurricane Irma in 2017, 10 employees insisted on staying behind with all the cats. Um, I imagine it was like, maybe it was just too hard or too expensive or almost impossible to evacuate all of them. So apparently the empl- one employee said when we started rounding them up to take them inside, they actually started running in almost knowing like it was time to take shelter. And sometimes I think they're smarter than human beings. Totally, Aww. totally true. The employees and 54 cats rode out the storm together, um, and and they had generators and food and water and medical supplies and all hung out. I mean, that sounds like an awesome time to me. (laughs) So today's real life haunt is a listener of the show. She didn't want to share her name, which is completely fine, but she did share with me some amazing experiences that she's had, and I will share a few with you guys. I'm going to save a few for future episodes. The first one is a visit that she felt like was from her mom, and it says, Five years ago, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and had to undergo a full hysterectomy, and a port was inserted into my rib cage. The port was for chemo, and on the first night of chemo, which was nine hours long, I came home and went to bed. As I lay there on my side thinking about the day, someone sat on the bed beside me. 
I also felt a cat jump on the bed at the same time. I like to think it was my mom, who died about 15 years earlier, of cancer. The cat may be a childhood cat. I don't know, but it helped me get over chemo, knowing someone was there watching over me. Such an amazing story. I feel like that was for sure her mom sending her a message that she is not alone, especially during such a hard battle with cancer. The next story that she shared with me is about her daughter, who's 11 years old, and it says it wasn't until six months ago that she has been able to sleep in her bed. She's been sleeping with her big sister. She kept telling me that she felt like she was being watched at night, and she felt like someone was playing with her toes. She had never seen them, just felt the touches. Apparently, there is a woman who is dressed in a 40s-style dress that stands in salute in her bedroom door. Another psychic told me it's a man by the name of George who attached himself to her from a cemetery. Six months ago, she has finally been able to sleep alone, and I don't hear about them anymore. And then the last story that I will share from her is about an old school, and it says, I used to work for a college, and the school was in a really old building in Toronto, Ontario. I believe the history of the building was it used to be an old athletic building, then police quarters, and it had a pool in the basement. And the story is a little girl died in the pool. Many years later, our school was there and we were investigating the rooms we would turn into classrooms. My colleague and I were looking out the window and on the outside ledge was a little girl sitting there. We turned around to look at each other and my colleague saw the little girl out of the corner of her eye. She was standing now outside the classroom. I didn't see it but believe her because we looked outside and the girl was gone. Another time when we were in the school, I had to go down to the basement where the files were kept in the old pool area. My friend Monica kept her office in the basement, and the ghost bothered her all the time, pushing her into the desk, turning the lights on in the file room. I wouldn't go downstairs by myself. Another time, it was really early, and I was working with no students in the school. I heard all of the chairs in the classroom above me scrape across the floor. When I went to look, it was all normal. I eventually left that job for a maternity leave and didn't go back. You can read about the building. It's called the Stewart Building in Toronto. Thank you so much for sharing those experiences with us, and I'll share those other ones on future episodes. That was a good one. Thanks, Madeline. Good find. And you know what? If you're sitting here thinking, I should really tell them about my crazy story, you really should. Be in (laughs) unrestpodcast at gmail.com. Unrest in peace.